I'd like to start out by saying that in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, under inspiration, Jeremiah says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So without the intervention of Almighty God in the affairs of men, there can be no true and lasting peace, not just in Jerusalem, but in the earth also. I'm sure you'll agree with me with all the uh, different things going on in the Middle East at the moment. You'll actually agree that something there needs to be a change and not just a change, a lasting change, a change that cannot be reversed and a change for the good of all mankind. And we'll see how the, uh, the Word of God actually reveals that to us as we go through tonight. I'd like to start out just by having a look. What is, what is peace? I mean, you know, we live in a, a society, don't we, where we go, you know, we'll leave this place tonight, we'll go home to a comfortable home, we we'll go to sleep. We don't really persevere some of the things and experience some of the things that other countries actually experience. <clears throat> the Oxford Dictionary says the, uh, peace is freedom from civil unrest or disorder, freedom from, from anxiety, disturbance of either emotional, mental or spiritual. Peace is, uh, it can be in an inner conflict, it can be it affect our inner calm and tranquility. Other dictionaries say it is a state or period in which there is no war or a war has ended. The basic Bible meaning of the word peace is to join. It gives the idea of quietness and rest, contentment. There's a quote where the Apostle Paul says, godliness is contentment in great gain. And the final uh, idea there is to set it one again, and that's really the the main basic theme throughout Scripture concerning peace, that's really what it means, to set at one again. Now, if you go back 6,000 years where Adam and Eve were, uh, were um, in a state of where they had disobeyed uh, God's law and they were sent forth from the garden, from that time to our present day, man has not been able to direct his steps, as we've seen in that quote uh, at the outset, Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. So the idea is to bring man back to that, to that position where he can be at one again with his creator. <clears throat> so do we see this sort of peace in Jerusalem today? Well, clearly, no, we don't. We see that there is violence and all sorts of bloodshed on every hand. But what we do see is this, gunfire, bombings, Hatred, violence, conflict, bloodshed, murder, instability, religious indifference. That's a big one, especially in the Middle East. Terrorism, fear and insecurity, and of course war, specifically in the Middle East. So we might ask ourselves, is it a city of peace? <clears throat> now, it's interesting to note that the first time that Jerusalem is actually mentioned in the Bible, it's in the Old Testament in Joshua chapter 10 and verse 1. Now, the name Jerusalem means vision of peace. But there was a time, ladies and gentlemen, when Jerusalem had a different name. In earlier times of biblical history, the name for Jerusalem was called Salem. And we get that from Genesis 14 and verse 18. The name Salem had a very different meaning, quite the opposite, which was peaceful. So from this, we can conclude that there was a time in history when Jerusalem, formerly known as Salem, was a peaceful place, or at least far more peaceful than the times that would befall the city in its future years after that stage. So that's the question, isn't it? Why is Jerusalem so important? Why do we continue to see all the conflict over this very small city in comparison to many other cities in the world? <clears throat> well, if you have a look at this map, I don't expect you to see the little chart on the side, but I will um, 
enlarge that in a second, but you'll see the yellow, green, and blue sites. The yellow sites, <coughs> the yellow sites are what are called the Christian sites. Then we have the green sites, which are the Muslim, and then of course down the bottom you have the blue sites, which are the Jewish sites. Various sites, um, some of them tourist attractions, some of them you're not allowed to go into. But these, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, are very important. You know, to modern Christianity, Jerusalem is most mostly important because it is the place where Jesus was brought to occasionally as a child, who later preached to the poor and such like in his adult life. He was cast out by his own people, crucified by the Romans and resurrected by God. To Islam, Jerusalem is considered a sacred site. In Islamic tradition, along with Mecca and Medina, Medina, Islamic tradition holds that previous prophets were associated with the city and that the Islamic prophet Muhammad visited the city in a nocturnal journey. I won't even try and get that word out. It, it's, it's, it, it's that in, uh, the, uh, obviously in the Arab language. And due to such significance, it was the first quibla or direction of prayer for the Muslims and the prophet Muhammad. And so he designated the Al-Aqsa Mosque for pilgrimage. And for the, uh, the Jewish people in Judaism, Jerusalem has been the holiest city in Judaism and the ancestral and spiritual homeland of the Jewish people since the 10th century BC. During classical antiquity, Jerusalem was considered the centre of the world where God resided. The city of Jerusalem is given special status in Jewish religious law. In particular, Jews outside Jerusalem pray facing its direction. Jerusalem appears in the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible, 669 times. And Zion, which usually is synonymous or means Jerusalem, uh, and sometimes called the land of Israel, appear 154 times. The first section, the Torah, only mentions Moriah, Mount Moriah, the mountain range believed to be the location of the binding of Isaac and the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. A little bit of history about the city of Jerusalem. I know I'm not going to read all these out. I'll just read some of the parts that are more significant. I've sort of highlighted the purple as the significant parts and the green parts as uh, where an invasion took place or, or foreign enemies uh, entered into the city. So you've got the reign of David. Uh, we'll go down a bit. King Solomon commences construction of the temple. Then you have the invasions of the Assyrian uh, of the northern kingdom. Hezekiah withstands Sennacherib's assault on Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar's second invasion. The Babylonians capture Jerusalem. And Nebuchadnezzar's third invasion and destruction of the temple. <coughs> then we have the Persian period. There was a remnant of about 50,000 Jews returned from Babylon by King Cyrus. Uh, if you'd like a copy of this, I'm not going to read them all, but you'll just get a bit of an idea of the more significant events over the invasions. <clears throat> and then we have the Hellenistic period. You can see where uh, Jerusalem is captured in the green. Um, and the last point there, Antiochus, Epiphanes, outlaws Judaism and profanes the temple. There's uh, the Hasmonean period, where Judah Maccabee recaptures Jerusalem and restores the temple. Then we have the Roman period. General Pompey captures Jerusalem for Rome. King Herod the Great captures Jerusalem. Um, and down on the second last point there, we have the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus of Nazareth. <clears throat> Continued on with the Roman period, uh, we have Pontius Pilate, Roman procurator of, uh, of Judea for 10 years. And around that time, the, uh, at that time, it was the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, in 66 to 73, we have the Great Revolt, which was the uh, war of the Jews against the Romans, the fall of Jerusalem and destruction of the Second Temple by Titus, the fall of Masada, quite a gruesome siege that was. Um, then the other points there in the green, Jerusalem again, in Jewish, uh, a, a Jew Jerusalem again, the, the uh, Jewish capital, and then down further, Jews not allowed under order, order of Hadrian, not allowed to enter into Jerusalem. <clears throat> then we come to the Byzantine period. Empress Eusodosia permits Jews to live in Jerusalem 
Persian conquest of Jerusalem, and they destroy most churches and expel Jews from the city. And then in 629, recaptured by the Byzantines. And then we come to the early Muslim period. Six years after Muhammad's death, the Caliph Omar enters Jerusalem and Jews are readmitted to Jerusalem. And in 691, the Dome of the Rock completed by Caliph and al-Malik. And then we have Caliph al-Hakim orders destruction of synagogues and churches. It's very, very up and down history the city of Jerusalem actually had. The Crusader Kingdom. Again, we can see in all these green points how there was a foreign invasion of the city being captured. Uh, Kurdish general Saladin captures Jerusalem from the Crusaders. He permits Jews and Muslims to return and settle in the city. And uh, quasi Rezamayan Turks capture Jerusalem and bring the Crusader rule to an end. Then we have the Mamluk period. So here we the Sultans rule Jerusalem, the Mamluks rule Jalu J Jerusalem, and then the more significant points, the uh, <coughs> Rabbi Moshe ben Naim arrives from Spain, revives the Jewish congregation, establishes a synagogue and centre of learning. And then we have the other uh, significant event, the Black Death plague hits Jerusalem. Then we have the Ottoman Turkish period. The Ottomans affect peaceful takeover of Jerusalem. Unwalled since 1219, Sultan Suleiman, the Magnificent, the parent, rebuilds the city walls, including the present day Seven Gates and the Tower of David. And then we come down to 1838, where the first consulate British opened in Jerusalem. 1860, first Jewish settlement outside the walls of the city. And then 1898, a very significant uh, point, is visit by Dr. Theodore Herzl, which was the founder of the World Zionist Organization. And then we come down to the British Mandate period, 1917 to 1948. British conquest and General Allenby's entry into Jerusalem in 1917. United Nations resolution recommending the partition of Israel, and that definitely would have intensified the conflict. 1948, we have onwards, we have the Israeli period. And so these are very significant points in the history of uh, Jerusalem and the Jews. 14th of May 1948, British mandate ends and State of Israel is proclaimed. The four, uh, 14th of May, the same day, uh, January 1949, Israel War of Liberation. 28th of May 19, uh, 1948, the city of Jerusalem is intact. The Jewish quarter in Old City falls. And it goes on. We come right down to 1994, we have mutual recognition of Israel and the PLO, and I don't have anything after that, purely because the same thing just goes right down pretty much to where we're at today, um, and the Jews and the Arabs are really, basically all they've done is, is, is this, this, the same debates and same arguments are still there, but I think the, uh, the Jews have just given the Arabs a little bit more land to occupy and partition part, parts of the land off to them. <coughs> Facts and figures about Jerusalem. Jerusalem is mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible. It was besieged some 27 times. Its foreign invaders consisted of Babylon, Assyrians, Rome, Greece, Saracens and Turks. We've seen that in the previous couple of slides. Jerusalem was destroyed two times, attacked 52 times and was captured and recaptured 42 times. So you'll see that's just an uh, artist's rendition of the, uh, I think it was, uh, the Babylonians and then the Assyrians and then the Romans. <coughs> so the Bible sets forth a prophecy in Ezekiel 38 concerning a future invasion of the land of Israel with a particular focus on Jerusalem. This foreign invasion will be headed by Russia along with e Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, France, Turkey and others. So the city of Jerusalem is yet to see another siege, according to the word of God. Now, apart from all the interest that uh, various religions and countries have in Jerusalem and its turbulent history, there is a much greater reason for Jerusalem's importance in the pages of the Bible. 
And this greater reason is found in the following Bible quotes. See, Jerusalem is set in the word of God as a place for God's name. And here we read in the first of Kings, And under his son will I give one tribe, that David my servant may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. These are the words of God. In Nehemiah, we have a very similar thing. Unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. And this is a, a repetition. You see this quite a few times throughout the word of God, where God speaks of his name being placed in the city of Jerusalem. In Daniel 9, and the city which is called by thy name. Jeremiah 32, verse 34. There are abominations in the house which is called by my name to defile it. First of Kings 9.3. This is a, an interesting quote. And the Lord said unto him, <coughs> this is uh, God speaking to Solomon, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Now the idea of that word perpetually there means from morning until evening, from morning until evening. And you'll we'll see what, that'll all fall into place in a minute. You'll see where I'm heading with that. From morning till evening. Now, because of Israel's disobedience and wickedness before their God throughout their turbulent history, in Ezekiel 11 verse 23, we read this. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Now I'm going to put to you that that was the Mount of Olives. Now this passage is telling us that God departed from the city of Jerusalem because of his displeasure with his people Israel. So when God's glory went up out of the city, he was effectively removing himself and his name from Jerusalem. Now the name and the glory throughout the Bible are synonymous terms. Now let me give you an example. If you turn with me to Exodus 33, in Exodus 33 verses 18 to 19, we have the occasion where Moses, uh, he, speaks to, he speaks to God and he asks God a particular question. In ex Exodus 33 and verse 18 and 19, And Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness, this is God, said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Then in chapter 34, he goes through and he shows that he proclaims the name and then points out all these characteristics about himself. So the name and the glory are synonymous terms. Now in Psalm 29 and verse 2, we read the following. Give unto Yahweh the glory due unto his name. Very, very, should I say, on a lot of occasions throughout the word of God, you will always find the word glory attached to the word name in the same sentence. And it's quite frequent. It happens a number of times throughout scripture. Such an interesting point. So when, <clears throat> when God departed from the city of Jerusalem, his glory went up out of the city and effectively his name and glory were being removed. Now, we'll see after how that's significant. So just put that thought in the back of your head for now. So Jerusalem is a place of importance to God first and foremost. As he placed his name there in times past, but his eyes and heart remain there. He hasn't withdrawn himself fully. He watches over Jerusalem and his heart is for his city of Jerusalem. So what have we seen so far? We've seen the meaning and definitions of the word peace. We've seen the city of Jerusalem is not living and operating in a true and lasting state of peace. We've seen that Jerusalem means vision of peace and whilst things remain the same, 
then peace will only ever be a vision and not a reality. The violent, turbulent and unstable history of the city of Jerusalem, and we've also seen that God had placed his name there, then removed it because of the wickedness of men. Not only his own people, but those of foreigners. Now, in Luke chapter 2, we read the following. And the angel said unto them, that is, the shepherds in the field, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, <clears throat> here we have the announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ, and are told that the good tidings would be to all people, and Jesus would be a saviour, and the heavenly host praised and proclaimed that peace would come through him. See, Jesus Christ will make peace a reality. And we'll see a, a range of different quotes that will show this as we move as we move forward. See, Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, was born to be king and ruler. In Luke 1 verse 31, we are told, uh, Mary was told by the angel, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob, which is the house of Israel, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. At his death he was declared king. Pilate wrote a title, Pontius Pilate, the Roman procurator, and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And now prior to his death, Jesus said these words, just before his death, he was being questioned by Pontius Pilate. And he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. See, no, Jesus' kingdom was to be of an order or arrangement. The word world there means an orderly arrangement. So that's the arrangement of that time. Now, here... <coughs> It, it's, it's, I've, I've written there that uh, Jesus' kingdom was to be of an order or arrangement that was to be in the future. And this is why he said, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. So this is to be at his return. It is indicated that great changes would have to take place based on God's ways and not man's. And you will see from 11, uh, Revelation 11 verse 15 there, it says, Behold, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So that is a fulfilment of this, this part here. And you'll see also in Psalm 72 and verse 1 and 2, we'll have a look at that a little bit later, it speaks about the righteous reign of the Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom, which he will take up that throne of David mentioned in Luke 1 when he returns to the earth. So Jesus Christ, being the Son of God, has the ability to rule righteously, something that man cannot do. Isaiah 11, we see in verses 2 and 4, and the Spirit of the Lord, when it says the Spirit of the Lord and the word Lord is in capitals, it's a reference to God, just so that there's no confusion. You think that's talking about Jesus. So and the Spirit of God shall rest upon him, the Lord Jesus Christ the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of God. And he shall <clears throat> and shall make of him of quick understanding in the fear of God, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove the equ equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, 
shall be slay the wicked. Isaiah 42 and verse 4. He shall not, <coughs> sorry, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. These are times to come, ladies and gentlemen. Isaiah 9. We have a prophecy before the Lord Jesus Christ was even born. And it says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with just judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the God of hosts will perform this. So he will reign from Jerusalem and teach and govern the nations. He was born to do this. He said that to Pontius Pilate. He said, Unto this end was I born, and unto this end came I, unto this end came I into the world. In Isaiah 24, uh, verse 23, it says, The Lord shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. And so we'll see how he governs the nations and reinstitutes one religion and a system of religion that is one. It's not like the multitude of religions we see in the world today. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of God's house shall be established in the top of the mountains <coughs> and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go with eagerness by the way it's written. They shall go with eagerness, and they'll be keen to do this, and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob or Israel, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. This is a time when men's steps will be directed. It's a reversal of Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. And so we will see, out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. So Jesus Christ will establish a new world order with a righteous government and one system of religion based in Jerusalem upon the ancient throne of David. Now we have the work of God and his son, Jesus Christ. Now earlier we've seen from that Ezekiel 11 verse 23 quote that God had removed his glory or his name, with those synonymous terms, from Jerusalem and stood upon a mountain which was on the east of the city. <clears throat> no, when God and his, son, and his son intervened with the affairs of men, this is what will take place. Zechariah 14 verse 4 says, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst. And you may wonder why I've put John chapter 10 there, because the Lord Jesus Christ says, I and my Father are one. So that's why you, you, when you read it there, it says, And his feet, it's in the singular. But here we have a, a the Lord Jesus Christ and God and a multitude standing in that day upon the Mount of Olives. So God's glory or name will return to the city of Jerusalem. And you'll see this as we have another look in a minute at Ezekiel 48 and verse 35. Jesus Christ, we're told, will build a temple of worship and teach the nations. In Zechariah 6 it says, Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man, whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Yahweh. This is the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ who will, who will build this temple for the God of Israel. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So he will be a king and a priest, residing over the affairs of that government coming out of Jerusalem and administering the one system of religion and worship to the entire world. Speaking of this grand temple, it says in Ezekiel 48 verse 35, and the name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. You'll find that the margin says Yahweh Shammah. In Zechariah 14.9 we read, And the Lord 
shall be king over all the earth in that day, shall there be one Lord and his name one. So Jerusalem again will be a place for God's name. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God has never given up upon his people, on his people Israel or his city of Jerusalem. He has been long-suffering and patiently awaits the day that will soon dawn in the earth, dawn in the earth, a day and time that he alone knows. Isaiah 62, verses 1 and 2. Here God says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory. Thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Jerusalem at peace and God and the king known by all. In Psalm 72 and verse 1, we read, I didn't want to read the whole chapter, but there's quite a lot of good points in there, so I just picked out a few verses. In Psalm 72 and verse 1, it says, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness under the king's son. So here's a clear reference speaking about God and his son. In his day shall the righteous flourish, and an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And we finally finish, ladies and gentlemen, with the quote that we started out in our reading tonight. In Psalm 48, verse 1 and 2, we have a beautiful vision of what is to befall the city of Jerusalem. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible holds out and God has extended to each and every person a beautiful invitation to be a part of this kingdom that will be on the earth. A kingdom that will, that's peace will never, ever cease. It will never come to an end and the Lord Jesus Christ will reign righteously as it says in Psalm 72. Thank you. <laughs>